Hello and welcome to So What You're Saying Is, I'm Peter Whittle. Now my guest today is somebody who was at the very forefront of the fight to maintain free speech. He's been on the show before, I'm delighted he's back. Toby Young, of course, is a well-known columnist, best-selling author. He also was the founder of Daily Skeptic uh, one year ago. Uh, the Free Speech Union, which he founded two years ago, uh, has become one of the great forces in the battle that we face. I know that sounds rather grand, but I mean, it is a very big issue, uh, Toby. But before we talk about uh, the Free Speech Union, I wonder, when it comes to all the restrictions coming off this week and the general feeling in the air of people backing away from their past stance, mm -hmm. I just wonder, do you feel vindicated in your position? I think I do, <laughs> broadly speaking, Peter. So, um, yeah, uh, I set up the, uh, a website yeah. called Lockdown Skeptics yeah. um, in uh, the beginning of April 2020. So uh, within a week of the first lockdown being imposed. And it was partly because um, I'd written a piece for the critic um, saying I thought the lockdown was a mistake mm. and would inevitably cause more harm than good. Mm. Um, and uh, uh, it, which was a, a fairly controversial um, mm. and um, minority view at the time. And I'd also written something similar for mm. The Telegraph and I got completely monstered, um, monstered on Twitter, um, lots of rude emails, friends kind of distancing themselves from me. It wasn't like, you know, being well and truly cancelled, which I, which I you was in, before, in 2018, course, yeah. but it was like a sort of, um, you know, uh, a sort of minor version of that. Uh, and it occurred to me that there was no um, uh, forum for people to express their dissent about what was happening. Everyone just seemed to accept that this was the appropriate and proper mm. response. Uh, the only way to deal with a pandemic of this nature, which was extraordinary because um, the lockdown policy had never really been tried in the way it was at the beginning of 2020 anywhere else in the world uh, in response mm. to a pandemic ever. Mm. Um, uh, and it had even been recommended against in a paper by the WHO in 2019, and it certainly wasn't part of the pandemic preparedness strategy, which was our official strategy for dealing with a viral outbreak. So it was extraordinary to me that this draconian, unprecedented intervention um, uh, should have been just accepted by mm -hmm. everyone as you know, the completely natural response. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, but, but, but nonetheless, um, uh, uh, there was no opportunity for anyone to, well, very few opportunities for people to express their dissent, particularly um, uh, people, academics, people in the medical profession and so forth. So I thought I'd start Lockdown Skeptics to create this forum. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it, it ended up taking over my life. I mean, it, it became a kind of, we produced a, a daily update. Um, uh, of all the stories we published the day before, as well as a summary of all the stories in the news and elsewhere about the pandemic. I, I read it all the time. And, 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 it, uh, uh, and doing it almost killed me. I mean, it was, um, I would be working on it sort of 14, 15 hours a day. Mm. I ended up sleeping in my garden shed because I was going to bed so late, I would have woken up my wife if I'd gone to bed at sort of 5 a.m. and I wanted to sleep in in the morning and not be woken up <laughs> by the kids. But, but it's like, I was literally, I would drag myself out of my bed, get up, sit in front of my my laptop and just be there stuck to it, maybe having a bowl of soup for half an hour mm. um, and then just kind of collapse at 4.35 a.m. and then get up and do it all over again. But it felt, you know, important um, to do it because there were so few voices of dissent at mm. that time challenging the kind of prevailing narrative. Um, and um, eventually I found other people to help mm. and uh, I relied on donations. It's always just relied on donations from well-wishers and that became enough to then employ a couple of people to help me do it um, and now I've turned it into a company and it's become the Daily Skeptic and it has um, four employees including myself um, and um, we had our record month uh, in the month of January we had two million plus um, page views um, which is um, you know it's it's more than uh, the Morning Star, the New Statesman, and Navara Media combined. Yeah. It probably doesn't compare with your figures, Peter. But <laughs> but but for for a kind of you know for a no, for a cottage not. industry Amazing. produced out of my garden shed, yeah. it's been extraordinarily successful. When you are sort of like really going against the tide, I, I wouldn't say of whole opinion, but you as you just described it, um, what's it like actually, Toby? For that, I mean, do you? Are, 
you're pretty strong-minded, obviously. I mean, uh, but does, does, do you feel embattled ever? I mean, do you sort of think, what am I doing this for, you know? Um, sometimes it's, um, it's difficult mm. um, to be, you know, very much on the outside. Um, uh, and you have to deal with, you know, not just polite counter-arguments, mm. but um, an enormous amount of personal mm. abuse. Mm. Um, but I think, you know, I mean, as a journalist, particularly, you know, um, uh, an iconoclastic, irreverent journalist, mm. um, you, you, you become accustomed to, mm. you know, um, attracting a bit of hate mail. Um, and um, I'd sort of gone through the ringer um, at the beginning of 2018 when I was well and truly cancelled and had to step down from five positions. Um, so, you know, I, I was sort of inured to it yeah. uh, by then. Um, I wouldn't say I've, you know, got a, got the hide of a rhinoceros, no. um, but I'm probably, you know, yeah. more thick skinned than average. Um, uh, it, it's tough when I think it, it's really tough when your family begin to notice mm. that it's happening and, and your kind of kids get abuse. You know, mm. um, I've never been an anti-vaxxer, but um, often people who are um, lockdown skeptics get kind of smeared mm. as covid skeptics mm. or anti-vaxxers. Um, and uh, my kids said that, you know, Friends of theirs at school would say, "Why is your dad an anti-vaxer?" Um, uh, and again, that becomes when it when it sort of creeps into you know your domestic life in that way, it can mm. become quite quite testing. But um, for the most part, that that doesn't happen. Um, and um, and you know, uh, one of the rewards of staking out these um, controversial dissenting positions is that sometimes mm. um, the rest of the world gradually comes around to your point of view. I'm not sure that's entirely happened yet um, uh, when it comes it might, to the lockdowns, though. but it, it looks as though it's heading in that mm. direction. Certainly amongst the general public, mm. amongst the kind of journalistic mm. class within the Westminster bubble, there isn't anything like as much enthusiasm for COVID restrictions as there was, you know, two years ago. And people come up with a number of kind of rationalizations to kind of explain why they've kind of, you know, mm. changed their minds and sometimes quite plausible explanations. But I'm beginning to think that, you know, the direction of the, the, the tide is turning. Yes. I, I mean, I think, you know, you're reading things like perhaps we were, were too harsh or, you know, that sort of thing. Perhaps looking back, we were maybe too harsh. Uh, but um, were you dismayed uh, or did you expect fellow journalists taken as a whole, particularly broadcast media, I have to say, uh, seemed so unquestioning? I mean... You would think, wouldn't you, any reporter worth their thought, you know, would, would question, well, first of all, where this thing has come from, and no one seemed to want to talk at all about that, and whether these things like lockdowns actually work. I know, that, 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 that point, Peter, it was extraordinary that um, there was so little intellectual curiosity mm. about the origins of the virus, mm. and anyone speculating that it might have um, been leaked from, you know, the... Uh, uh, virology Institute in Wuhan was, you know, for, for, for a long time smeared as a conspiracy theorist trafficking in misinformation. Mm. And that kind of smear was enough to kind of shut down debate about it for more than a year. Um, and, you know, we, we now know the story of how that was partly orchestrated by various senior scientists and scientific gatekeepers who didn't want to antagonize their Chinese allies, mm. shall we say. Um, uh, but but um, uh, yeah, I was disappointed by my mm. colleagues uh, mm. in the mainstream media for, for not challenging the official narrative more energetically. I mean, there were, you know, there were pockets. Um, yeah, Peter Hitchens in the mm. Mail on Sunday, Alison Pearson in the Daily Telegraph. Um, uh, you know, there, there were some kind of heroic, um, uh, you know, um, uh, people who, who, who stood out from the crowd and genuinely questioned what was happening. I was really impressed by Lord Sumption, who I think was, you know, risking quite a lot in staking out that territory because it was so at odds with the kind of prevailing uh, view within his kind of, you know, intellectual class yes. and his peers. And I think that was a large part of it. I think, you know, you ask yourself, well, why, why did so many mainstream journalists toe the line? effectively, um, just accept the official narrative at face value, uh, in many cases, just regurgitate mm. propaganda that was being kind of churned out by Downing Street with the mm. help of the behavioral insights team. Um, and I think it, 
it, it, lots of people think it must be part of, you know, a conspiracy. And they point to the fact that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation funds some of some journalists on The Guardian and on The Telegraph and so forth. Uh, and imagine that kind of, you know, these journalists are kind of part of this kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, global conspiracy headed up by Klaus Schwab and Bill Gates mm-hmm. and the rest of it. I don't think that's it. I think it's, it's, I mean, if it was that, you know, that, that would sort of in some ways be kind of, um, well, it would certainly be more understandable. Um, I think it's, I don't think they needed to be bribed. Mm. Um, uh, they, they just, it was just group thing. Mm. A, a lot of it was status signaling, I think. You know, mm. if, if it became very quickly established that if you were a dissenter, if you didn't buy into uh, lockdowns, and if you didn't, if you if you weren't completely convinced that the vaccines were the solution when the vaccines were rolled out at the beginning of last year, um, you were immediately tagged as a sort of deplorable. Mm. You know, you were someone who wasn't properly educated. You were there was you had something in common with the kind of you know animal skin wearing kind of protesters who <laughs> who stormed the capital on yeah, you know yeah, January yeah. the sixth. Yeah. yeah, it was like it was like it was like being a Brexiteer, mm. but worse. Mm. I mean. There was certainly an effort by Remainers to kind of smear Brexiteers as sort of beyond the pale, as these sort of knuckle dragging troglodytes, racists, um, uh, and you know. But 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 it seemed to be more effective at shutting down any kind of dissent from the kind of COVID orthodoxy yeah. over the past two years. And it became a kind of if, if it was. I think lots of lots of senior journalists, um, uh, people like you know, I don't want to name names, but but I think that it was it, it was a way to going along with the narrative was a way of signaling that they were a member of the kind of ruling elite. Mm. I mean, one of the extraordinary things about the last two years was um, it wasn't just that people um, uh, journalists kind of didn't challenge the prevailing orthodoxy, but they saw it as their job to enforce compliance mm. with the kind of public health coronavirus regulations. They thought that they were doing good by doing that, but also it was a way of aligning themselves with the kind of responsible class, with mm. the metropolitan elite, mm. a way of signaling that you were, you know, a member of this kind of responsible, uh, this custodian class. Mm. I mean, it was sort of... Uh, uh, but I think I think it was I think it was largely that it was kind of groupthink, status signaling, uh, wanting to do something in this crisis, feeling it was the right thing to do. Often there's a kind of overlap between virtue signaling and status signaling. I think it's it's that rather than you know anything more sinister. It's just a kind of yeah. failure of kind of um, uh, uh, what's the word um, uh, uh, sort of absence of any critical thinking really. Yeah. I think, I mean, one thing I would say, I would agree with that. Uh, what I found interesting when the restrictions came, or Plan B or whatever came off last week, I have to say that just for a while, in my sentimental way, um, you mentioned, I mentioned Brexit. Um, I did have a slight, just a glimmer of pride. I thought, my God, this country's the first one to do mm. this. Somehow, by some kind of strange, circuitous kind of genius, we somehow have been the first to actually be become free again, uh, as it were. Um, just before we leave this subject, I, w- I wonder, when it comes to the whole Boris thing yep. and the parties, um, the general force of argument has been about the shocking hypocrisy, um, you know, shorthand there. Uh, but my feeling is, is that the basic part, the most important point, is that they didn't believe themselves in it. I mean, would you agree with that or not? Do you think it's just a case of, oh, well, yes, this is what we have to do, but well, we'll get round it. Or do you think it's actually that they never really believe? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's hard to tell, Peter. Um, uh, I mean, could you say the same thing about Neil Ferguson, um, you know, the leader of the Imperial College modelling team whose apocalyptic projections um, mm. in March 2020 prompted um, Boris and his cabinet to do a U-turn and impose the first national lockdown, and also, I think, influenced the decision to lock down around the world. Um, and then was later caught out having an affair with a married woman, um, uh, even while he um, had just tested positive for coronavirus. Um, and, and you sort of think to yourself, well, does that mean that yeah. he doesn't yeah. think these restrictions um, are actually going to interrupt transmission and are kind of pointless? Mm. Uh, and why has he been? And, and I don't think so. And I don't think in the case of Downing Street, 
either. Um, I think it's just um, they think the rules are for the good of the general population mm. um, and that um, it's in the interests of the country for everyone to um, comply with those rules. But um, they don't think the rules apply to them. Mm. Um, they think, uh, you know, from a sort of utilitarian perspective, I suppose, that yeah. if, I, if I break a couple of rules here and there, um, it won't make, a, won't make a big dent in the general good that the rules are doing. Mm. Is it that? I mean, may, maybe it's a, a degree of cognitive dissonance that they think that, um, you know, I'm, I'm an intelligent educated person so i can make a kind of risk benefit calculation myself mm. but but these kind of uneducated masses they need me to tell them mm. what to do and to order them to stay in their homes because they're incapable of making that kind of calculation themselves i mean you know uh, something which was clearly wrong as we've seen in countries where they've had less draconian restrictions and you know no greater covid death toll than us like co like uh, sweden um but uh, it's hard to know why they were so cavalier uh, and, and um, you know, behaved so flagrantly, hypocritically. I mean, I was thinking about, you know, the, the party, one of the parties that Sue Gray um, is uh, investigating and apparently is being investigated by the Metropolitan Police, which was the party held in Carrie's flat, um, at which ABBA's um, winner takes it all was supposedly played because Dominic Cummings had just departed. And this is it's sort of um, presented as a reference to uh, Carrie triumphant in mm. her battle with Dom. And you sort of think, my God, you know, could there have been anything more hubristic yeah. than holding a party where you play winner takes it all to celebrate your victory over Dominic Cummings? And in the act of doing that, the very act of doing that, you're handing Dominic Cummings the gun that he's going to use to assassinate you. I mean, it's, uh, it's pretty remarkable. Um, exactly. uh, but, um, you know, I mean, of course, it's hubris, it's arrogance, it's thinking the rules don't apply to them. Um, uh, Maybe maybe it's sort of an acknowledgement. Um, I mean, people read it as an acknowledgement on their part that the, the rules were entirely pointless and completely ineffective and they just wanted to be seen to be doing something yeah. for kind of Machiavellian political reasons, didn't mm -hmm. actually think they'd make any sort of impact on, on interrupting transmission. And maybe, maybe that's partly true. I'm mm -hmm. not close enough to it. But um, uh, I mean, I've always thought that Boris was fairly sceptical about mm -hmm. the... Um, benefits of um, the lockdowns mm. and you know um, and that's part of you know Dominic Cummings is um, sort of narrative is yes. that D Dominic uh, that, that, that Boris was you know he wobbled he dragged his heels he didn't want to do it he didn't think it was really important um, uh, you know and uh, I've always rather liked that mm. about Boris mm. and um, and I sort of think now you know um, uh, uh, for all his shortcomings he got Brexit done, or you know, but well, he did his best to get Brexit done. Although Brexit hasn't entirely been done, and I'm not sure that any successor wouldn't kind of, um, uh, 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 you know, try and do a reverse ferret of some kind, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, leave a lot of loose ends untied. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so there's there's that consideration. But I also think that you know, bad though he has been, and disappointing though his acquiescence to the various lockdowns was. Um, uh, he did at least um, uh, stand up to uh, all the kind of bedwetting hysterics and mm -hmm. release all the restrictions on July 19th mm -hmm. of last year, Freedom Day, in spite of the apocalyptic warnings from, you know, sage, independent sage, their mm -hmm. kind of obedient chorus in the mainstream media. Nonetheless, Boris stuck, stuck to his guns on that one, turned out absolutely fine. Mm -hmm. um, and again, the attempt to go further than Plan B restrictions uh, in the run-up to Christmas, impose a Christmas lockdown. I mean, maybe Boris doesn't deserve all the credit for that. I mean, I saw a piece in the Mail on Sunday in which Rishi Sunak had clearly briefed, you know, their mm. chief political correspondent saying, no, no, that was all me, you know, mm. staying mm. Boris's hand, me and Jacob uh, and Lord Frost. Um, but um, uh, nonetheless, you know, he did, he did, as the kind of decision maker, he decided not to go beyond plan B. Uh, and that turned out to be absolutely the right decision. And you sort of think now, having seen 
Sage and others cry wolf twice. Yeah. When they cry wolf a third time, Boris is going to going to be fairly reluctant mm. to listen to them, uh, which you think is good. Also, I think the fact that you know he himself broke the rules makes it much harder for him to insist everyone else yes. obey them again. I mean, you can't imagine a political leader across the West for whom it would be politically more difficult to impose another lockdown. So I think for that reason he should be kept in office. But yeah. you know, I also think that bad though his. Bad though he's been, you know, it's hard to find another leader who's been better. I mean, you mm. know, maybe the Prime Minister of Sweden, um, uh, uh, Ron DeSantis in uh, Florida. Yep. Uh, but there are very few political leaders to emerge with any credit uh, over the last two years. And I do think Boris is one of the few, um, uh, you know, one of the least bad mm. at any rate. Um, uh, so, you know, even though he's been terrible, he's been better than almost every other Western political leader. It's in, in, during this whole period of restriction, you know, when we, of physical restriction, um, we've also had a growth, I would say, in psychological restriction coming from different angles. I mean, because, and it sounds fanciful, but over the past two years, obviously, uh, in terms of free speech, in terms of the kind of growing woke agenda, um, that has sort of placed, again, a, another restriction so people have been physically restricted, but also they're, they're increasingly worried about what they can and cannot say. This has grown, and that's a rather clunky segue uh, into talking about the Free Speech Union, or the FSU, as you refer to it. Um, it was two years ago this month that you founded it, wasn't it? Uh, sorry, two, two months, sorry, two years ago this month, February, that yeah. you founded it. Um, why did you do it, actually? begin with why did you start it was it because of your own counseling yes in part anyway mm. so um when i found myself um you know um uh twisting on the end of the kind of pitchfork mm. wielded by a mob mm. um i was very conscious that there was no organization to turn to for help mm. you know to give me impartial professional, legal, and sort of PR advice. Um, you know, when you find yourself uh, uh, in that situation, um, you know, you can see your career that you've spent, you know, 25 plus years building up on fire, literally burning to the ground. Mm. Um, and, um, and, you know, it's, it's quite panic inducing. And you really want um, some sort of guidance as to, should I throw some sand on it? Do I kind of, do I kind of, get a fire hose and try and put it out? Where do I direct the, the, the stream? Um, uh, and, and there's nothing, really no organization to provide you with, with that kind of advice. You're getting a lot of conflicting advice from all directions. Um, uh, and, um, and I thought when I sort of came through it that it would be great um, to set up an organization that did precisely that. People who find themselves targeted for cancellation, being put through an investigation in the workplace or at a university, um, uh, uh, people who are being punished, penalised in some way for exercising their lawful right to free speech, uh, who've, who've kind of whipped up this kind of angry, feverish kind of mob, um, mm. an organisation they can turn to yeah. that, 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 that can provide them with some calm, reasonable, professional assistance, tell them what the best what the best thing they can do is. Um, uh, uh, and that was really the kind of wellspring of the idea. It, um, so but, in, but yeah. In that case, actually, it, it really is genu a union, isn't it? I mean, it is a union just as much as the firefighters union or whatever. People it, come to you. They join yes. it, don't they? They join yeah. it. And then so how does it work, actually? For well, people who want to join. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's a membership organization mm -hmm. and um, you can join um, uh, for as little as twenty four ninety five a year, and you can stagger that over you know monthly yeah. payments. Um, the standard fee is forty nine ninety five for full membership. Um, and um, in addition to you know, it's like an insurance policy, I suppose. Mm. Um, if something happens to you, you know, we can provide you with a whole suite of services. Um, you know, including legal support mm. if, you know, that's discretionary. But if we judge that it's an important winnable case, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll provide you with legal support. And we have a full time chief legal counsel, a legal officer who works four days a week. And an incredible amount of our time is taken up with um, uh, managing various, mm. fighting various legal cases. I mean, we're, we're behaving like a How many medium are you talking size. about, actually, like on a daily basis oh, we've got a, We've got about, I'd say, two dozen cases unfolding mm. simultaneously. 
Um, uh, and we get about 50 cries for help a week, I'd say, mm. to our, you know, either to our hotline or to our help inbox. And we end up helping about half of them. Mm. Um, and, uh, but we don't just do casework. That's about 50% of what we do. We also organize events. For, they've mainly been sort of um, online events up until now. Mm. We're beginning to organize some in-person events. We also have a research and a kind of briefing arm, doing a bit of lobbying. Um, so it's sort of growing. Um, but as you say, it, it, it's like a trade union. It's not legally a trade union, but it is like a trade union. Yeah. Um, so the, uh, and one of the, one of the great benefits of trade unions, you know, back in the 19th century when they were first formed is that, um, they would protect people mm. who wanted to say things which weren't against the law, but which were likely to get them into trouble. You know, yeah. They're going to criticize their bosses, criticize working conditions. Um, uh, uh, and unions seem to have lost sight for the most part of that role of protecting the speech rights of workers. Mm. And that creates a kind of real opportunity for us to, to move in to that, to that space and do that. I, uh, it was quite interesting. Uh, I was having a quiet glass of wine in my local Weatherspoons um, not that long ago. And, uh, you know, they produce a magazine in Weatherspoons. And on the back of the, I think it was the back, there was a whole article by you about the free speech union, about the threat to free speech. And I just thought, I have to say to her, I thought, that is enviable outreach. I mean, here you are in all the... Did you get much of a response from that? It was incredible. I, I, I got a better response to that piece than anything else I've ever written. Um, uh, it was extraordinary. I mean, I, it, hundreds of people, uh, you know, yeah. who just read it in yeah. a Weatherspoons, yeah. who wouldn't normally yes, exactly. have heard of it, yeah. uh, contacted me and said, this sounds fantastic. How do I join? Or lots of people say, I got into trouble for saying this. Can you help? We ended up helping yeah. some of them. Uh, so, yeah, that, that's been an extraordinarily effective bit of outreach. What would you say? We had Harry Miller on quite recently again, um, just after he'd had his co uh, Court of Appeal victory on that particular, on the non-crime hate incidents point. Um, when it comes to what you've been doing over the past two years, is, what's been your biggest success, do you think, or most significant in well, your mind? Um, uh, we were a little bit involved in in Harry Miller's case, so we had um, we had said to Harry um, when he was weighing up whether to appeal the High Court decision to the Court of Appeal. The High Court decision was great from his point of view, but it could have been even better because even though Justice Knowles condemned Humberside Police as the Gestapo and said they shouldn't have investigated Harry's thinking, you know, for, mm. for retweeting a. Mm comic verse mm. about trans people. Nonetheless, the judge in the High Court said that the College of Policing's guidance, which Humberside Police were following, was lawful. Mm. And so Harry challenged that in the Court of Appeal. And when he was weighing up whether to do that, um, you know, the risk was that he'd lose and there'd be a costs order mm. given against him and he'd be in the hole for, you know, a lot of money. Mm. Um, and um, so we said, look, if, if We'll we'll back you. So you know, if that happens, we'll help you pay those adverse costs. And I think that that helped him make up his yeah, mind to yeah, challenge it yeah. in the court of appeal. And we would have been, you know, um, uh, out of pocket mm. um, in a big way had he lost. But mm. thankfully, mm. he won. Mm. Um, uh, and um, I mean, he deserves, you know, um, uh, all the credit. I mean, he, he's an extraordinary, courageous, and tenacious man, mm. and has struck a huge blow. Um, uh, for free speech uh, by winning both those cases. I mean, you know, NCHI's non-crime hate incidents are still there. Yeah. Um, and the next step, you know, lots of people, and when I say lots, I mean, you know, uh, probably close to 200,000 people in England and Wales have non-crime hate incidents recorded against their names, which will show up on their criminal records mm -hmm. in some cases when prospective mm -hmm. employers voluntary organisations they apply to work with uh, do enhanced DBS checks on them. So they're, they're still there. Yeah. I mean, it may be that fewer are now being recorded, perhaps not even any are being recorded until the College of Policing revises its NCHI guidance to comply with the Court of Appeals verdict. Um, but nonetheless, these need to be expunged. Mm. And one great victory earlier this week was that um, uh, uh, one, of the, one of the fair cop, Harry's organisation, helped get uh, a, a non-crime hate incident expunged from oh, no, a wait a minute. Yes. Was, was Is this the case of the lady with the book that was taken away by the police? Or no, it's a different one. It's a different one. Um, and um, uh, uh, and uh, we, 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 we are now going to, I think, say to all our members, 
um, you know, if you want us to write to the police, if you think you've got an NCHI recorded against yeah. your name, we will write to them and ask them to expunge it. And if they don't, we'll threaten legal action, which is how Fair Cop succeeded in this yeah. particular case. Um, and um, uh, and I think we'll, we'll publish an FAQs on our website too, just telling anyone, mm -hmm. member or not, how to go about, here's a template letter to write. Uh, because it's really, it's, it's you know, it's a scandal yeah. that nearly 200,000 people um, uh, you know, have, have blighted employment prospects merely because they've exercised their lawful right to free speech, oftentimes engaged, mm. you know, robustly in, in a debate about, mm. you know, trans rights or something similar. Uh, um, uh, it, 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 they have to go. Yes. Um, is there some, obviously, you, it's very clear what you do and, and what you offer, but is there a sort of a legal thing? Is there anything in the legal field, a law or, or some such, which in your view, in the FSU's view, has to either go or change. Is there a specific, have you, in other words, have you got an aim to somehow or other get something scrapped or revised? Well, um, you'd be amazed, Peter. I mean, when, when I, you know, set up the Free Speech Union, I thought we'd be campaigning, to, that, that most of our campaigning energy would be consumed by um, trying to repeal existing restrictions on yeah. free speech on the statute book. Mm. Um, uh, uh, and I didn't imagine, you know, at that stage, February 2020, that things could get much worse. But actually, they then got worse yeah. by an order of magnitude, mm -hmm. partly as a result of the pandemic, which mm -hmm. resulted in a huge amount of, you know, lawful speech being suppressed. Uh, we saw it last week with Joe Rogan. Um, mm -hmm. But in addition, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, mm -hmm. suddenly it became absolutely taboo to challenge any of these kind of wild completely unevidenced claims being made by kind of anti-racist activists. Um, and we saw lots and lots of people who we came to the aid of who got into trouble for challenging in the most reasonable evidence-based way some of these claims. Nick Buckley, good example. Yes, yes. Um, he was one of our great successes quite yes, early on. So yes. he wrote a blog post. I mean, I'm sure you know the story. He's probably, been you've on. Had, you've talk, had him on the yes, show. Uh, yes. but, um, uh, he just criticised the aims as stated on their website of BLM, didn't he? That's right. Yeah, he, he didn't. He didn't. He didn't uh, appeal to anything other than what BLM said yes. on its own website, um, uh, and it said things like wanting to end capitalism, dismantle the nuclear mm. family, defund the police, and so forth. Uh, and um, he was monstered, and the charity that he had set up um, uh, then fired him as chief executive. I mean, really extraordinarily kind mm. of cowardly behaviour on their part. And we found him. Uh, I, I called him, said, "Can we help?" He said, well, maybe you can. We found him a, an experienced charity solicitor um, who agreed to do the work pro bono, um, eventually got, um, got Nick reinstated to that job and all the trustees resigned one after another. Um, so that was, a, that, was a, that was a huge victory. And I'm delighted to see that Nick mm. has gone from strength to strength mm. after that. Mm. Um, uh, but to go back to my original point, you know, I thought we'd be campaigning to, you know, uh, repeal those laws which was but actually yeah. most of our campaigning energy has been devoted to stopping things getting worse yes, yeah. i mean you know a good example is the online safety bill i'm yes, sure you've discussed yes, it many yes, times yeah. um but um that's safety a census, by the way it was once called up <coughs> was it was called the, the online, online harms bill, bill originally yes yeah yeah, yeah they've it's become more kind of uh, it's yeah. been changed to uh, perhaps with the advice of the behavioral insights team to make oh, it more yes, palatable yes. we've had you her know, on uh, too uh, laura you know she wrote all about the uh, nudge theory yeah laura um with the uh with this uh, online safety bill then um what is it that you would campaign to what you think it should be scrapped or basically or just revised or what well it's often a tricky judgment call um when uh thinking about these bits of legislation do you just outright oppose it you know on principle and kind of make that argument mm. in the public square um knowing that it'll probably happen anyway mm. or do you think about you know what you can do pragmatically to improve it even though it's a pretty ghastly piece of legislation and i tend to side well, I tend to go with a more pragmatic approach. So um, I think there's, I think it's politically unstoppable. It's going to happen. Um, doesn't matter how energetically we campaign against it, how how much we try to mobilise opposition to it. There seems to be so much political momentum behind it. And if you look at other, you know, other countries, Germany, Spain, 
um, uh, New Zealand, um, very similar legislation has either been passed or is going through the kind of parliamentary legislative sausage mm -hmm. machine. So I don't, think, I don't think we can stop it, but I think we can improve it significantly. Mm -hmm. And um, one way in which we can improve it is that the Law Commission of England and Wales has proposed various reforms to communications law. Um, uh, so it would repeal the Malicious Communications Act, which is a pretty egregious um, uh, piece of legislation, um, and replace all the communications offences with a single harms-based communications offence. Um, and this would enshrine the principle that it is the business of the state to protect people from psychological harm. Mm. And that is a pernicious principle. Mm. And me and Lord Sumption had a bit of a barney about that um, uh, at Ditchley Park last week. Uh, he's just dead against it, which I'm sure is the right position to hold. But my pragmatic view is, OK, let's accept this recommendation of the Law Commission, because what they're proposing isn't as bad as the... Um, uh, uh, various bits of legislation it would be replacing. Let's try and define psychological harm incredibly narrowly and precisely. Let's include the Law Commission's proposals in the online safety bill and make sure there's a read across throughout the bill of that definition of harm. So internet companies, Ofcom, cannot just pluck things out of the air and say they're harmful. They can't just respond to politically motivated complainants saying, I was harmed yes. by hearing this mm. gender critical point of view by Kathleen Stock and it shouldn't be on the internet. Um, there's, there should, it should include across the bill, embedded in the bill, should be this very narrow, very precise definition of legal harm. And the only things internet companies, social media companies should be obliged to remove by Ofcom should be content that meets the threshold <clears throat> for criminal prosecution under this right. new harms-based communications offence. Anything short of that should not be removed. And if, if social media companies remove it, then there should be a right of appeal and they should yeah. be fined as much as they are for leaving it on if they remove it, if they shouldn't remove it, if it right. doesn't meet that criminal threshold. So that, uh, it's a very specific thing. Uh, so basically this is the lobbying part of what you do isn't it yes so i mean essentially <coughs> how would i mean people always ask this obvious answer so how does one do this in your case you have to build up enough influence presumably with with government and with mps in order to, to take this on board and to change it that's what you have to do that is a very long process is it not it is a long process um uh we have a, a legislative affairs director part time, right? Um, uh, and it's it's work. I when I was um, involved in education, yeah. um, I was involved in a certain amount of lobbying then, yeah. when I was head of the New Schools Network. Um, so it's not completely unfamiliar territory. Mm -hmm. But I also think that with many members of the parliamentary Conservative Party, you know, you're pushing at an open door. Yes. There are lots of yes. Conservative MPs, particularly amongst the you know the red wall seat holders, um, who are very pro-free mm. speech, very concerned about the erosion of free speech, mm. you know, across various sectors. Um, uh, so, so there's a lot of kind of sympathy there. Um, uh, there there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's an audience there willing to listen. Mm. Mm. And I think with the online safety bill, um, you know, um, I think that I think there's, there's certainly scope to improve it dramatically. Right. But I don't think there's scope to, um, you know, get it scrapped mm. altogether. I mean, another thing that could be done to improve it is at the moment, um, uh, there is um, uh, a reference to social media companies, search engine companies having a due regard. They need to have a due regard for free speech. Mm. But due regard is the weakest of the legal mm. duties. And mm. it's certainly weaker than um, this duty of care mm. they'll have to their users mm. to prevent psychological harm mm. befalling them. Adult users, not just mm. children. Um, and, um, and, and it's been designed that way. So in the event of a conflict between free speech and safety, safety's going to win. And they mm. won't have to offcom when kind of um, adjudicate, when, 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 when um, uh, scrutinizing the decisions made by mm. search engines. Um, they won't have to, it won't be a tough judgment call because it'll be clear in the bill, safety, psychological mm. safety takes priority over free speech. We want to get that that, that due regard strengthened. Right. So free speech at least has the same, is given the same weight by social media companies and ultimately by Ofcom when judging whether they've got these calls right. This uh, applies to England, right? The English legal system, uh, in the sense that obviously Scotland's got a, 
a different legal system. I mean, the reason I was asking is that some of the things coming out now from Scotland on the issue of free speech just make the blood run cold. I mean, this domestic uh, hate speech, uh, where, whereby you know, if you say something at home which could be called hate speech, you know, this is somehow it's now going to be ille illegal. Mm. Uh, it's unbelievable to me, Toby, but presumably that's the sort of thing you would campaign yes. against, but it's in Scotland. Is it, is it, well, do you operate only in... in we, no, we, we are um, uh, uh, raising our profile in Scotland. Mm. Um, we had a, a, a conference in Scotland in November of last mm. year, and there was, you won't be surprised to learn, a lot of enthusiasm, a lot mm. of support from some, you know, pretty senior people um, for uh, a much bigger presence uh, for the Free Speech Union yeah. north of the border. Yeah, sure. And um, we're going to um, uh, have another conference um, in April um, and we're going to launch a campaign and we're looking at what that campaign issue should be. And one of the things we're looking at is challenging um, the Scottish Hate Crime and Public Order Act um, uh, under the European Convention on Human Rights. Yes. Um, yes. And uh, it remains to be seen how challengeable it is, whether 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 a challenge along those lines would succeed. Right. Um, it, it, but it, the really alarming thing, Peter, is not just that Scotland now um, uh, probably um, uh, is, 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 has, has the least free speech uh, than any other mm -hmm. country in Europe. Uh, the, fewer legal protections yeah. for free speech than any other country in Europe, including Hungary, because this bill's been passed. Um, but the uh, Law Commission of England and Wales, um, in another mm. proposal, has proposed a hate crime bill almost identical mm. to the Scottish one for England and Wales. Mm. Uh, it actually goes further than the Scottish one. In the original Scottish hate crime bill, the proposal was that um, uh, people should be, <coughs> you should be able to prosecute people for stirring up hatred, not just against the uh, current three categories of protected people, which is on racial grounds, religious grounds, um, or um, uh, sexual, sexual orientation, sexual. Um, but they wanted to vastly increase the number of protected characteristics uh, you can be prosecuted for stirring up hatred against. Mm. Uh, and at the same time, this was originally in the Scottish Bill, remove the necessity for the prosecution to show intent. So if your words had the likely effect of stirring up hatred mm. against one of these protected groups, uh, then that would be enough to secure mm. a prosecution, regardless of whether you intended them to have that, have that effect or not. That was, that was that in the debate about the bill in Holyrood, uh, that went. Mm. So that's gone, that's not in the Scottish Hate Crime and Public Order Act. You still have to show intent, you will have to, to mm. secure a prosecution for stirring up hatred uh, in Scotland. Mm. In the Law Commission of England and Wales' proposal, they have also proposed that uh, intent shouldn't be necessary to secure a prosecution. It's not necessary in the case of stirring up racial hatred at the moment, but that's the exception. Mm. Um, uh, if, you wanna, if you wanna secure a conviction against anyone for stirring up hatred against another protected group, you have to show intent. Yeah. And the Law Commission is arguing, well, for consistency's sake, you know, just to make it all consistent, mm. let's not make it necessary mm. to show intent in any case, mm. and, and let's vastly increase the number of protected characteristics. So, I mean, it's, it's a horrible, proposal which will have a really chilling effect on free speech um, but at the moment as things stand it'll if this if this proposal if this English and Welsh hate crime bill is passed in uh, in Westminster as as proposed it'll actually be worse yeah. than the Scottish yeah. Yeah. hate crime and public order act I mean it's extraordinary you know given the fuss that was made of seeing that you know uh, uh, all the criticisms that that Nicola Sturgeon attracted for passing that bill you know totalitarian one-party state yeah um uh, uh for the law commission it's so tone deaf to think let's have the same thing in england and wales but let's make it even more draconian even more draconian. And, yeah, that, and that's a battle facing us and you know just as a coda to this a very similar proposal has been made in northern ireland it's not quite at the same stage as the proposals for england and wales are yet but it's getting to the same stage we're about to publish a paper opposing this proposed scott uh, northern irish hate crime bill. I mean, it's incredible how you think kind of, again, it's sort of, um, you think, is, is there some kind of cabal, yes, you know, exactly. um, yeah. orchestrating yeah. Uh, th this kind of assault on mm -hmm. free speech? Because similar bills have been passed, you know, uh, across the world. There's another bill, very similar, going through the New Zealand 
Parliament mm. at the moment. In various US states, similar laws have been passed, again, removing the need for people to show intent in order to prosecute someone for hate speech directed against a protected group. I mean, it, but I think it's just group thing. I mean, they all go to the same academic conferences, they read the same books, but oh, this yeah. kind of woke virus, it just kind of, it, <laughs> yeah. it just, it just kind of yeah. seems to jump from person to person yeah. without requiring kind of central coordination, partly as a result of, you know, social media. With the, with the, this, the English and Welsh uh, proposal from the Law Commission, this is a battle you say you're going to have to, to fight, but at what stage are they then, Toby, in the sense of, like, how much time have you got? Well, um, uh, the Joint Parliamentary Committee, which recently um, published its recommendations about what should be changed about the online, uh, the online uh, safety bill, um, proposed that um, many of the things that the Law Commission wanted to include in, a, in an English and Welsh hate crime bill be included in the online safety bill, right. including this, uh, the enlargement yeah. of the number of protected groups yeah. you can be prosecuted for stirring up hatred against, as well as the proposal that it, it shouldn't be necessary to show intent uh, in order to secure a prosecution. That was the recommendation mm -hmm. of the Joint Parliamentary Committee, which, which scrutinised the online safety bill, and they've, they've said, yeah, these recommendations should be included in this bill. Um, and that bill could come before Parliament uh, and that recommendation could be followed up, um, you know, in the next few weeks. So we haven't got much time. No. I think you might have answered my question, actually, but I was, I was going to ask you, sort of by way of ending, where you see the greatest threat to free speech coming from now? I mean, generally. Um, I mean, for me, it's, it's, a, it's quite a, um, you know, it's not actually even a thing. Um, but various surveys have shown recently that young people um, no longer actually really even care or believe in the concept of free speech. I know that you've written, I'm sure, about this, but, but certain things are far more important to them. Um, so it's not even a case of, oh, yes, of course I believe in free speech, but, you know, the, the old one used, mm. used to get that. Now they really don't even believe it. To me, that's the biggest threat we face, actually. Yeah. But um, would you agree with that, or is there something else? No, I, think that's, I think that's right. Um, uh, I mean, we keep winning mm. um, battles mm. at the Free Speech Union. You know, 75% of the cases we take on, we win. Mm. But we're losing the war. Mm. Uh, you know, I read the other day, um, uh, about um, all these multi-academy trusts mm. involving hundreds of schools, primary and secondary schools, um, introducing kind of mandatory anti-racism lessons, which effectively silence mm. anyone um, who doesn't kind of sign up to the kind of BLM ideological agenda. I mean, extraordinary mm. and possibly even unlawful mm. under the Education Act 1996, which prevents, you know, prohibits political indoctrination of children. Yeah. Um, you see this kind of thing happening in schools up and down the country. I mean, it's worse typically in Scotland than it is in England. And we saw Brighton and Hove kind of uh, 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 proposing similar. Oh, the uh, racial uh, lack of innocence, uh, seven-year-olds. Seven-year-olds. Yes. I yeah, mean, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and you think kind of uh, every time you, you win a battle, you know, you then realise that, um, you know, this is just the tip, what you're seeing, these victories are at the tip of the iceberg, below the surface, mm. you know, the war is being won by the kind of massed armies mm. of these kind of woke fanatics. Mm. Um, and um, what can we do about it? Well, as you say, it's a kind of, it, it's essentially a cultural problem. And I think, you know, law is downstream from culture. Mm. And, um, and, and one of the successes of the enemies of free speech is that they've successfully created the impression that they're on the right side of history. Mm. You know, this is the direction of travel. You know, people like you and I are antediluvian, you know, Bufton Tufton types mm. who haven't understood, you know, why um, free speech is harmful mm. to kind of historically marginalized groups and why if we want to bring them into the conversation, the speech of people like you and I has to be restricted. Mm. Um, uh, you know, 
History's on their side. And that's a very powerful argument. You know, I think that um, that was one of the things which did for um, uh, the Soviet Union and the mm. kind of communist control system across Eastern Europe in 1989. The feeling that, you know, they were on the wrong side mm. of history, mm. you know, that, that their experiment had failed. Mm. Um, uh, it's a tremendously powerful mm. political narrative. If you can persuade people, this is the direction of travel, you need to go along with it. It's a way of getting people to do, you don't really think it's inevitable. You know, you have to tell them it's inevitable to persuade them to do your bidding yeah. to make it inevitable. Yeah. Uh, but that, that's been a powerful kind of argument. Um, and and we, need to, we need to challenge that. We need, to, we need to persuade people that the erosion of free speech, prioritizing emotional and psychological safety and well-being over robust the robust exchange of ideas, that's not inevitable. And persuading young people of that is, is you know, that's the real challenge. And the Free Speech Union has been involved with the battle of ideas in yep. setting up something called the Free Speech Champions Programme, trying to identify young people on campuses willing to get out there and make the argument. When <clears throat> Eric Kaufman did some research about how little enthusiasm there was for free speech amongst students uh, for, I think, policy exchange um, last year, maybe yeah. the year before. Um, one thing he discovered was that if you read students out a kind of short passage, just making the basic case for free speech, pointing out why it's important uh, and why it should matter to them, uh, many of them changed their minds yes. and, and became quite enthusiastic about free speech. And that was the sort of wellspring of the Free Speech Champions program. But it suggests that one of the reasons young people aren't more pro free speech is they just haven't heard the arguments. You know, the other side has successfully suppressed uh, mm. any opposition to their kind of woke fanaticism, um, uh, often by threatening to cancel people who do challenge it. But you know, if you can just get voices out there, if you can just make make the argument in the public square yes. in a way that young people will listen to, maybe you can persuade them that it isn't inevitable. You know, there isn't such thing as the tide of history. Yeah. History is what you make it. The future's in their hands. And it's important that they should defend free speech. Uh, and, and if you look at if you look at teenagers, this is the source of hope, I think. It's mainly anecdotal at this stage. But you look at 13, 14, 15 year olds. Um, they're beginning, I think, to bridle at right, all these right. restrictions mm. on what they can say. You know, cancel culture has become almost a joke yeah. to them. If someone says something they disagree with, they say, oh, I'm going to cancel you for that. You know, yeah. um, uh, and, 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 and you, I mean, it's not surprising if, if any teenager has got a bit about them, given that their parents, their teachers, the BBC, everybody is kind of churning out the same propaganda day after day, of course, they're going to start to yeah. push back a little bit against it. And I think you're beginning to see that. And, you know, it's remarkable how often young people contact, you know, the Free Speech Union and say, uh, am I old enough to join? Um, I recently discovered this um, Canadian um, psychologist you may not have heard of on YouTube called Jordan Peterson. And a lot of what he says <laughs> makes a great deal of sense to me. And I'm thinking, you know. <laughs> well, look, that, that, that's very, very heartening. In fact, it's very interesting, actually, you, you say that the, the sort of stuff that's being put out now by academies and schools, which might actually even be illegal, you know, this sort of, uh, the, you know, I've got a family member who's actually in this very position at the moment. She doesn't want her kids to have to go and listen to identity politics stuff and everything. And the teachers, in fact, said, well, it's actually a legal requirement. So I think we will look into that and see if it really is. Um, Toby, thank you. So much for that. Uh, it could, it was very much a root and branch explanation, exactly, of what people can do and where you, how you can help them. When, um, uh, when it comes to the website, it's the freespeechunion.org.uk, is it? It's, it's just the freespeechunion.org. .org, yeah. .org freespeechunion.org. And uh, again, to join, it is, uh, you've got a sliding scale. Yeah, so if, 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 if you're, if you're um, the, the standard price is about 50 quid a year. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, but if you're a veteran or a student or a pensioner, yeah. it's 25. Okay, there you go. Um, congratulations on two years of it anyway. Toby. Thank fantastic you. Fantastic what, what you're doing. Thank you very much for coming. Thanks, Peter. Um, there you go. I'm sure we'll speak to Toby in about a year's time. I hope if he comes back. Um, we shall see you next time. So thank you very much. Bye. Hello. If you're enjoying the New Culture Forum channel, and you believe in our mission, may I invite you to join our membership scheme.
at the link below or on our website, newcultureforum.org.uk. Our work is more important now than ever, and we have great plans ahead for the future, but we can't do it without your support. From as little as three pounds per month, you can help ensure that we continue on our mission. As a member, you'll receive a range of benefits, including access to exclusive content, invitations to our private events, including here at our studios, free copies of our books, and much, much more, including, of course, our famous NCF mug. If you aren't able to become a member, then please help us by clicking this button and subscribing to our channel. It's completely free. Just remember to also click the bell icon so that you can get notifications when we post new videos. Thank you. Thank you.